let's continue uh, with problem 3c. This is going to give us a hint of some very important properties of convolutions and relations to another thing that we discovered we wanted to invent, the delta function, or the, really the delta distribution. So we're going to convolve f with a window function, symmetric, just for simplicity, for minus a to a, height 1 over 2a, so the area is 1. And we're going to then take a going to 0. And we know that convolving with this guy gives us a moving average uh, of this function. And as that average gets tighter, we should be just concentrating more and more on the value of the function at t, and we should just get f of t. And it's not hard to show that. And this is one of the first places we'll actually try to be really uh, quite rigorous. So this is, of course, the integral uh, from t minus a, sorry, to t plus a of f of t. We've seen that already. It's a previous result. Or in other words, it's the limit of those averages. Let's denote it average from t minus a to t plus a of f. Okay, so let's uh, sort of zoom in here. We've got, this is t, this is t plus a, and this is t minus a. Can you see that? Yeah, okay. Then the average value, well, let's see. Uh, I happen to have it as a decreasing function. Well, let's see, let's, let's give it a little bump. Like okay. So here's the maximum value, and here's the minimum value. One of the most basic properties of averages, the property that an average pretty much has to have, if you're going to call it an average, is that that average value, whatever it is, is got to be between the min and the max and the min. Okay, so this value, so let's, let's postpone actually evaluating the limit for a second. Um, and so this is a fact about integrals. So this is the fact we're going to use. and I'm going to assume this as known. It's very easy to prove based on pretty much any definition of integration. And we'll try to remember if we go back and really redefine integration, we'll try to remember that, make, make sure to prove this guy, but it's really. So it's a fact about averages, but that means it's a fact about integrals because integral is just the average, just the integral divided by the length of the interval. And so the average is between the min and the max. And the reason that's useful is the min and the max are actual, honest to God, values of the function. And what happens when a goes to 0, when that interval gets, shrink, it gets smaller, the min and the max get closer and closer to the value of f of t. Why is that? Because we're assuming that f is continuous. OK, so OK, well, I'm going to erase that fact. So the, I've got a limit of a bunch of values that maybe are wiggling up and down in a kind of interesting way as a goes to 0, but they're always between the max and the min. And as a goes to 0, oh, one thing. I, did, I forgot to put in the PDF, and I haven't changed it yet, I don't think. Uh, let's just look at a goes to 0 plus. That's really the picture I want. If, if a is negative, everything's just kind of flipped. It's not particularly, um, it'll still work, but it's not particularly more interesting. So a goes to 0 from the right, from positive values. The max approaches f of t, and the min approaches f of t by continuity of f. And um, by the squeeze theorem, that means the average has to equal f of t, has to, uh, has to converge to f of t. OK, and so this is f of t. OK. so. This opens up a little interesting discussion. I'm going to erase this again because we're really pretty done with it. Okay. Um, let's let's draw the the graph of f again. Here's f, and then so here's well let me let me make it pretty wiggly. All right. Here's a particular value t. Here's t again, and the the convolution is a smooth version of that. So this is f star r a minus a, where a is not incredibly close to 0. It's big enough so that we've smoothed out this kind of jagginess on this, scale, this length scale. But as a goes to 0, we're seeing that this particular value, for a particular value of t, okay, so this is for all t. But what that says is if you pick, pick a particular value of t, these numbers, 
the heights at that point of these functions, as you look at the sort of the movie, let's think about a, about a movie, I won't actually make a movie, of this guy getting closer and closer and letting the jaggies come back and letting this and not averaging over his big uh, distances, this value will approach this height. Now, what it doesn't say, and we, we could try to prove this later and see if we need more assumptions, it doesn't say that the rate of convergence of, say, at this value of these guys to this guy is the same as it, as it will be over here. And it really, at least quantitatively, the rate wouldn't, we wouldn't expect it to be the same. Uh, so, for example, if f has some very, very high frequency stuff here, and then is actually already pretty smooth here, then what we'd expect is that the smooth version is going to be is going to take out those jaggies, and then it's not going to do much here. If a is maybe on the order of like uh, this length or something like that, then that's enough to smooth out these guys, and it's not actually going to have a huge effect here. So as a goes to zero, the values of the convolve function are going to get close to this guy really quickly because they weren't ever very different. Whereas over here, it's going to take a while until the a is smaller than this characteristic length scale of the of the oscillation to actually start to see those oscillations come back and, and be recovered. Okay, so um, what this is, what we've proved here is we've proved that the function. So here's a little more advanced perspective. The function f star r minus a to a uh, converges to the function f as a goes to zero from, from the right. And we've proved it pointwise. What that is, is we picked any particular point, not a special point, any point, but we picked the point, and then we showed that the limit is equal to f of t. But that the rate at which that convergence happens might be different for different, for different values of t. And uh, the terminology for that, not necessarily, oh, crap, I don't have enough room. Um, I don't really need the formulas anymore. Okay, so that convergence is not necessarily uniform. This is one of the big things. Somebody has already mentioned in one of the comments the idea of uniform continuity, uniform convergence, that kind of thing. Um, there's a uniform, you can sort of put uniform in front of a lot of mathematical concepts and then it makes them stronger in a way that's sometimes absolutely necessary. Um, we're not, we haven't proved it's not uniform necessarily, but this is, it gives us a suspicion that we, we might need to be careful about that exact issue, that the rate of convergence might be different at different points. Okay. So that's just an advertisement. So it's really another to-do list. Hmm. Uh, think about this, see if it's ever going to be a problem for us. Uh, right now, it's not actually, we don't need it yet, and I'm trying to not introduce stuff until we need it. Um, okay, so part D is interesting. I would love to have a function. I've got this, this operation, f star g. It is linear in both variables, so you can scale or add in each variable. It is a commutative and associative. It's a beautiful algebraic structure. It works a lot just like multiplication of numbers. That, that's all the properties that it shares with multiplication. What, it, what about having a unit, like, a, like the number one is a unit for multiplication? Is there some function such that d star f equals f? If so, of course, it would also be f star d. It would work on both sides because of commutativity. Is there some function that would do this? Okay. So, again, if you haven't thought about it, um, pause for a second, especially based on what we were just talking about. Okay. Um, we would need... So this is supposed to be a weighted average of f based on this weighting function. We want it to recover f itself. And look what we had here. When we have any kind of interesting averaging, it tends to destroy high-frequency features of my function. So the one thing that convolution has a really hard time doing is leaving a function alone and not doing anything. Now, what we saw with the, the result we just did, I think I want the picture, we saw that the limit of f star r minus a of t, as a goes to 0 plus, that was equal to f. Okay, so wait a minute, maybe... Maybe we could pull the limit inside here. Big, big question mark here. Okay, so is the limit of a convolution, where one of these guys is, is a variable function based on this parameter, is that the same thing as f star the limit? Okay. Big, I'm not suggesting this is necessarily true. In fact, there's some very big issues with playing these kinds of games. 
but that would be a, a suggestive thing to do. Okay, um, let's say that's all of t, right? Okay, but then what would this limit be? And this has already come in to previous uh, previous uh, videos. That would be something we're taking this uh, symmetric window function, and then we're making it narrow and higher, narrower and higher. Remember, it was really crucial so that this would work out. Uh, this would work out, and I didn't get an extra factor to make f like six times larger, as we saw in a previous example. It was crucial that this was the little r. This was the one with the integral one, and so that as the width shrinks, it has to get taller and taller. And the problem is we're trying to take that to zero, and so all we we would get something that's zero everywhere but at zero, and then infinity here. You can't put that into an integral. You can't go back and say, well, okay, yeah, we're just going to put a zero infinity function in here and actually make sense of really using the definition of the integral. So it, you might think this is a dead end and there's just no such thing. Well, it does suggest correctly that there's no ordinary function. You really can't define this as an ordinary function and have this work. But this is exactly another way to characterize what we want the delta function to do. It's actually going to be one of the nice, nice properties of the delta function and how the delta function interacts with convolution. It will actually be the unit for the convolution operation. But we don't quite yet know how to define it. Turns out, very soon, in the next handout, we'll start focusing on that. And it turns out that the insights we've had from convolution, uh, this idea, these ideas of weighted averages, are exactly what we need to get a very cool, somewhat sophisticated, but actually not super hard way of defining the delta and many other distributions. Okay, so let's look uh, just one more in this handout, question number four. Okay, so uh, I've noted already in these expressions like what we just had, I've had this fairly asymmetrical viewpoint where the left-hand function has been something to be worked on pretty arbitrary in a lot of the examples. Um, and the right-hand function is a specialized tool, and then we use it to modify f. Okay, so here's the weighted average over from, you know, from t minus a to a of f, okay? Um, and in particular, these guys have had uh, bounded support. They've, they've vanished outside of a bounded set. Okay, it's just usually an interval just like this guy, okay? So um, I wanna, wanna play with that a little bit, okay? I wanna say, well, what if I take a convolution of like f with the heavy side function, the unit step function? Remember that's just this doot, 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 up to one. Okay, that has a bit of a different flavor. Now it's still I'm still taking the perspective that this is arbitrary and I'm using this as a tool, but it's a different it's a tool of a rather different form. And in some of the previous examples, the h has actually showed up on the left as a simple example of something we might want to modify, and then we've sort of smoothed it out, right? Because we, we had some examples where we smoothed out this, this jump. So this is going to look a little different. Now, of course, it's just the same thing as h star f. The, that distinction between left and right is artificial. But let's, I just want to put it in the context of how we're sort of gradually expanding our examples. OK, let's just look at what the heck this does. OK, totally naively, we're just going to write down the definition. But we are going to make sure that we see if there's anything weird or dangerous. Okay, all right, h of t minus tau. Of course, what that does, it, like any fu characteristic function, something that's just 0 or 1, it just changes the, the limits of integration. It says that t minus tau had better be positive. Or in other words, tau had better be less than t, but it could go off to minus infinity. And that's it. Okay, it's just the integral of f. Now, it's the integral from minus infinity to tau. So if I had a function like this, do 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 like that, and it was like going off to infinity or not even going to zero or something like that at as you go way left, this is not gonna work. It's not gonna exist. So that's why in the statement of the problem, I said we should assume that f either just vanishes to the left of some like minus m or something. So it has support only to the right of minus m, okay? Or we don't have to be so uh, restrictive. If it just vanishes really quickly, or get, goes to zero really quickly, uh, but not actually equals zero eventually, something like that will totally work. So this could work as an f for this example. This could work as an f. And what do I mean in the statement of the problem is a little vague. What do we mean by vanishes quickly enough? It just means vanishes quickly enough to make these integrals uh, finite. If you don't like 
manipulating improper integrals, and it's worth it to be careful about that. A really good way to, to make this a little bit more, uh, be a little careful and separate out two issues, is let's just go ahead and do a, a standard integral split and say, what we really need to do is just check that this one number is finite. That's what we really need, and that's what means that we need this guy to go to zero pretty quickly as we go to infinity, go to minus infinity. And then this guy is perfectly tame. Again, as long as f is some sort of halfway decent function, like piecewise continuous or something like that. Okay, so um, it's just an and so it's an integral uh, with a variable upper limit of of f, and of course that's an antiderivative of f. So when you take the derivative, let's erase all this stuff. The derivative of this puppy is, of course, just the derivative of all this. That's a constant. And by FTC, that's equal to F of T. So this is really cool. Uh, this is does go beyond the idea. If you always think, and I, I've been encouraging this so far, but if you always think the only thing that a convolution can be interpreted as is a, weight, a moving weighted average. That's not good. I th claim you should try to interpret them often as weighted moving averages. But with h here, there's no way we can really think of this as, this, a, as a sort of a window function. In particular, there's no, there's no way we could have scaled h to have integral 1. It has infinite integral. So it does get pretty far beyond the idea of a weighted moving average. But what is cool, what's cool is it says that convolution, in certain cases, encodes other operations. Convolving with the unit step function is anti-differentiation. It is integration. Okay, so this is the two, you know, the two big ways to describe the second half of basic calculus. Integration is the same as anti-differentiation, and we've now found that it's the same thing as convolution with the unit step function. That's awesome, and a good place to stop.